Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 18 of my beta campaign. One of the things I like to do with these videos is always try to construct a theme. I play through the game normally, the way I normally would play, and then I take what I end up doing and look at kind of what's, what's a theme that's emerging out of that. And, and I think what I'm going to make the theme of this particular video about is orbital maneuvering. And I talked on and off about orbital maneuvering in past videos before, but um, you know, orbital maneuvering is a big part of Kerbal Space Program. It's a big part of getting done what it is you need to get done. So we have a couple of missions. We have this satellite mission that I'll be talking about in just a second, and then later on we're going to get our crew of the Hipparchus Space Station to get some work done, to travel out to some satellites and get some work done. So what we have here is a mission to put a satellite into a particular orbit, and it needs to have a particular inclination. So the first thing you want to do, this first step, step one, is to uh, kind of line up the ascending and descending nodes of your target orbit and take note of whether you are going to be going north or going to be going south at your launch. With this launch, because, you know, we're going to be launching to the east, and as we go towards the east, the orbit is going up towards the north. So we're going to be launching, launching towards the north. Also, the location where the ascending and descending nodes meet is where you want to launch from. That is going to be your launch location so that you can launch straight into this inclination. Now certainly, there's nothing to stop you from just launching into an equatorial orbit and doing the inclination change in orbit. But inclination changes are expensive and you want to avoid them whenever you can. So always, if you can avoid it, you know, if you, if you can do it, launch into the inclination that you want to do. Now, this particular mission, we have an inclination that we need of 7.5 degrees. Uh, normally, we'd be launching towards the east, so that's a heading of 90 degrees. Um, but we want an inclination of 7.5 degrees, so what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 7.5 degrees from 90 degrees to get 82.5 degrees. That's the eventual heading we want to be going after we finish our orbital insertion. Now, um, that doesn't mean that you're going to go launch and go straight into 82.5 degrees. You actually want to aim a little bit north of that because you're going to be, remember, the, you're already moving towards the east. Your prograde vector is automatically going to be going towards the east because Kerbin ro rotates towards the east. So you actually have to kind of pull that vector towards the heading that you want. So you want to aim a little bit north of the 82.5 degrees. Um, that, uh, and that, that pulls that vector towards you. And then as your inclination closes into 7.5, and here I have Kerbal Engineer to help me watch my inclination. As my inclination closes in on 7.5, I can bring my heading closer to that prograde vector. Now, of course, I'm doing this with uh, Kerbal Construction, or Kerbal construction. What am I talking about? Kerbal operating system, and that helps me out a lot. But doing it by hand, you're going to do the exact same thing. It doesn't matter. And by the way, of course, if you were launching towards the south and you wanted to have an inclination of 7.5 degrees, then you would add the 7.5 degrees to the 90 degrees, and that's the heading you would eventually want. And now that we're in low Kerbin orbit, with the inclination that we want, and also where our ascending and descending nodes are where we want them to be. Um, it's time to deal with getting the argument of the periapsis in the right spot. And that's really easy because they show you where the periapsis and the apoapsis is of the target orbit. So all you have to do is burn to one of those. It doesn't matter which one. So here I am setting up a maneuver node. And the idea is that uh, I'm just going to put the apoapsis of my maneuver node right at, in this case, the periapsis of the orbit that I want. Though I could just as easily shoot for the apoapsis of the orbit that I want. It doesn't matter. It's just this is the one that's coming up first. And I don't know. I always like to put uh, my apoapsis of my uh, projected trajectory to be a little bit ahead of the periapsis I want because I always find that I end up moving that um, that that point forward as I circularize. And so this will get um, the eventually the argument of the periapsis in the right spot. And we of course we perform that burn and then we just time warp out to apoapsis. So we have our apoapsis at about 
2,606 kilometers, which is around where we want our eventual periapsis to be. So once we get out there, it is just a simple matter of burning prograde to do our final orbital insertion. Now if you want, you can set up a maneuver node at this point. That's easy enough to do. But what I kind of prefer to do is to simply use the information that's provided to me by Kerbal Engineer, burn prograde until I get to the point that uh, my apoapsis reaches its target. In this case, I want my apoapsis to come out to be about 3,131 kilometers. And once that's hit, I then hit all of the orbital parameters. And this one has the gamut. I have a specific ap apoapsis, a specific periapsis, a specific inclination, a specific longitude of the ascending node, and a specific uh, argument of the periapsis. And although all of that sounds complicated, because they actually show you your target orbit in space, it's not that difficult to do. A little while ago, I was all over waiting it out until I can upgrade the uh, research and development facilities. But, uh, you know, that $4 million plus is not coming anytime soon. So what I thought I would do is maybe put my energy more towards upgrading either the VAB or the tracking station. I went with the tracking station because this is going to allow me to start to track asteroids. And I wanted to do that just so I can start to insert some more variety in the missions. Last episode I mentioned that I want to start putting my Kerbals that are up in the Hipparchus station, I want to start putting them to work. And what I have in mind is to get them to start to deorbit some of the satellites that are now useless uh, and just simply cluttering up my map view. But unfortunately, uh, the ones that are still up there, either one, have too much fuel, or too little fuel, I'm sorry, so I can't deorbit them, or two, uh, there's one actually that's completely dead. It's got no electrical power whatsoever. So what I need to do is I need to send up some Kerbals to it and I need them to connect to it and either transfer over some fuel or transfer over some electricity or both. And uh, then I'll be able to deorbit those things. But those Kerbals don't have the tools they require. So that is what this mission is about, is to give them those tools. There's a second thing that this mission is about and it's a bit of an experiment. I have another one of these uh, put another space station in orbit and it has to be able to house five Kerbals and have power and have an antenna and have docking ports. And this has, well, some of that, but it doesn't have an antenna. At least the what I'm bringing up doesn't have an antenna. The transfer vehicle obviously does or else it wouldn't be flying right now. Um, and it doesn't have any power. It doesn't even have any batteries, I think. No, I did put some batteries on it, sorry, but it has no solar panels on it. Um, all it is is a docking hub, so it's kind of an inert thing. And what I'm curious about is if once I connect this on, will it count this contract as being complete? At the time I did this, I, re I really wasn't sure. So it was kind of, I thought, an interesting experiment, and uh, we'll sort of see how it goes. What it also has on it are some toolboxes, and you can see them there on the right and on the left. You'll get a better view of them soon enough once we put them into use. And inside that is a variety of equipment, and some of which is going to help our Kerbals attach to uh, our satellites and transfer over some resources. So we get our docking hub up here at to the Hipparchus station, but before we can attach it, there's something we need to do. We got some work we got to do because where this hub is going to go is right between the two habitat modules that I happened to have strutted together last episode. So I'm going to have to send out Bill once again to uh, take apart those struts he so carefully put in last time so that we can insert this thing in there. And then what we're going to have to do is take this station apart. So I thought it would be best not to leave anybody inside the station and instead put all my Kerbals, including our scientist Rodbart, into um, the Kuryus so that in case anything goes wrong, you know, they're in the safest place they can be in. Now I thought what would be best, because I need to get uh, this hub out of the way, this habitat module, so I thought what would be best would be to turn it 90 degrees away and then uh, just kind of detach it and hopefully it won't drift all too far away and um, and then that way, you know, when, when I can put the hub in there and then once I put the hub in there, 
I can then uh, put this thing back on where it needs to be. But I thought, well, you know, if I detach it, any force, it's going to push it out perpendicularly. It's going to send it away. And then I'm, well, what the heck is going on here? I mean, how does it end up drifting in that direction? Oh, this is not good. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, my uh, contract went green. Oh, so my experiment is done. Well, that's interesting. Uh, these contracts get so confused. I didn't even get the docking hub anywhere near being attached yet, and it's counted this contract as being complete. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take that, I guess. But, uh, oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah, I scratched the paint on that. That would be sounding terrible if that was it, if anybody was inside there. Oh, well. No harm was done in that little incident, and the rest of this went fine. We were able to insert our new uh, docking hub and get it into place and put our uh, modules back together again the way we intended them to be. Uh, I built this module, by the way, out of just uh, airplane fuselage, those empty structural fuselage pieces. I, I kind of like that look. It's I like that sort of clean look in the... Um, the uh, translation tools that are built into the VAB now really helped a lot. Uh, you can build these things out of lots of different things. Another thing that really looks good if you want to go for more of that industrial look is to build these things out of the uh, structural girders. They, they, they end up looking really nice. And then you can actually light them up from the inside, which looks pretty cool. Of course, Bill has to go back out there and reattach some of those struts that he disconnected. And now we can take a look at the toolboxes that we have here. Uh, inside the toolboxes we have lots of miscellaneous parts. I packed lots of things in there not really knowing what I would need but one of the things I did put in was lots of these strut end parts so we can get some extra strut end parts and really sort of put this thing together so that it can be as rigid as we can have it. And uh, the one other thing I put in here are uh, fuel pipe ends. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these onto the curios because we're going to be needing these for what's coming up. So with that done, it's on to the mission. And the mission is to deorbit the two satellites, JunkSat 8 and JunkSat 8 Redo, which were put up there several episodes ago and now are kind of annoying me. So I'm going to go for the JunkSat 8 because it's the trailing of the two satellites, the one that's further behind. And since we're in a lower orbit, we're going to need to catch up to it. So we're going to catch up to that one first. So I'm going to set up a maneuver node. I'm actually still on the station right now and I just want to set up a maneuver node because I can see that I'm going to have to go around a little bit and so I just want to get a sort of a feel for how many orbits do I need to do um, before I'm ready to do this burn and I figure well I might as well do those orbits while uh, my Kerbals are comfortably in the station rather than in the Kuryus. Pretty soon I see that I'm going to get myself a pretty sweet encounter right by one of the, uh, what is that, that one's the descending node. So that's alright, and with a little bit of tweaking I can see that I'm going to get my encounter in about an hour and 40 minutes. So then it's just a matter of time warping that station around until I am there. And a few minutes before uh, we get to the node, we uh, make sure the Kuryus is all stocked up and we send it on its way. I decided to put all three Kerbals into the Kuryus because, I don't know, it didn't seem to me to be proper form to leave anybody in the space station without any way to get out if things happen to go badly. And we're going to be gone for probably two or three hours on this particular mission. Now, one of the things that ended up happening here is I lost my maneuver node because the maneuver node was attached to the space station and not to the Kuryus. So as soon as I switched over to the Kuryus, the maneuver node was gone. So I had to set it up again. Uh, that's no big deal. Of course, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to try and get my encounter to happen at either the ascending or descending node. And if that means I have to use a little bit of normal, either normal or anti-normal, to try and push one of those nodes around to get it to happen where my encounter is, that's fine. But actually, that didn't end up happening. I got really, really lucky. And I was able to get my encounter to happen at one of the nodes just by timing it right and by doing 83 meters per second for my transfer burn. Now, I've talked about in the past how you are better off when you're doing these transfers to not match inclination at the beginning and to do this, you know, just get your encounter any way that you can and then match you know, and then and then just match velocities when you get to the other side, um, and 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 so let you know just to sort of drive this point, let's let's actually go over numbers. Everybody loves some numbers, right? So let's go over some of the numbers on this one. Now you'll see people they'll say, 
Uh, no, what you want to do is you want to match inclinations first, then you want to do the transfer. So let's go over the numbers that come out if you're going to do that in this situation here. And in this situation here, I'm going from a, uh, a roughly circular orbit of an altitude of 120 kilometers to a, well, not quite so circular orbit, but close enough with an altitude of about 238 kilometers with an inclination change of 6.5 degrees. Now, if you want, you can look up on the internet all of these formulas, they're actually very, very useful. I use them all the time. Um, but uh, So if you want to verify my numbers, go ahead. But the if you were going to make the tr inclination change um, before you made the transfer burn, so you're making the inclination change at an altitude of 120 kilometers, that inclination change of 6.5 degrees would cost you 251 meters per second. And like I said, Inclination changes are expensive. 251 meters per second is quite a bit for just a 6.5 degree inclination change. The transfer burn to get from the 120 kilometers to 238 kilometer altitude is 83 meters per second. And then to match the orbit at the 238 kilometers takes another 79 meters per second. And if you add that all up, 83 plus 79 plus the 251, that comes out to 413 meters per second. So that would be the cost of this entire uh, maneuver if you did the inclination change first, 413 meters per second. Okay, now I'm going to show you what it costs for what I do here. As you can see, the transfer to get out there is 83 meters per second. Boom. Then I'm out there. Now, once I get out there, I have to match inclination anyway. There's no way out of matching inclination because eventually, you know, if I'm going to match uh, velocities with that target vehicle, I'm going to be matching its orbit. So I need to get an orbit of 6.5 degrees uh, inclination change no matter what I do. But the key is, is while I'm matching velocity, I'm going to be matching the orbit of the target vehicle and I'm going to be matching both the altitude of the orbit and the inclination at the same time. So I'll be doing both a prograde burn relative to Kerbin even though it's a retrograde burn relative to the target but that's fine. <laughs> and that will cost me that 79 meters per second again and I'll be doing the inclination change at an altitude of 238 kilometers and an inclination change at that altitude of 6.5 degrees only costs 233 meters per second so instead of the 251 meters per second for the inclination change it's 233 meters per second so a little bit of a saving right there but the savings get better the key to this is I am making the inclination change at the same time that I am making my uh, prograde burn not one and then the other, I'm doing it at the same time. And in fact, you can see that happening right here. So, because I'm doing them at the same time, you don't just add them, what you do is you use the Pythagorean theorem. So to figure out the total of 79 meters per second plus 20, 233 meters per second when the two burns are perpendicular to each other, you go 79 squared plus 233 squared, and then you take the square root. And that comes out to be 246 meters per second. That's for both the, that's the entire orbit matching at the end. That's the match the velocities. So if I take the 246 meters per second and add it to the 83 meters per second it took me to get out here, that adds up to 329 meters per second. Instead of the 413 meters per second that it took me the other way, that's an 84 meter per second saving. That's significant. That's a 20% saving over matching inclinations first. And although this turned out to be the ideal situation, you'll see that if you get in the habit of doing it this way, of getting your encounter and then, you know, doing the velocity matching when you get out there, you will always save more than if you do the inclination change first. Well, with the rendezvous out of the way, it was Tom Plot's job to close the distance between the Kuryus and JunkSat 8. Now, JunkSat 8 doesn't have any kind of a docking port on it, so we can't, we can't dock with it. So the idea here is just to kind of park up along beside it as close as we can. And while Tom Plot carefully maneuvers the Kuryus in, uh, Rodbart 
begins his pleading with Bill to let him be the one to go out there and do the AVA this time. Bill's had lots of experience doing EVAs and connecting struts and doing construction in space, and Rodbart's been studying all the manuals, so with some last-minute tips from Bill, Rodbart is the one that goes out there. And the way this is going to work with the pipes is you just need to take a pipe, and you need to link to it, and then you just need to connect that pipe over to the satellite and suddenly these two vessels have become a single vessel and you are now permitted to uh, transfer any resources you like across just like you would transfer any other types of resources and I uh, figured that if I could get the tanks of JunkSat 8 to be about 25% full that should be enough fuel for me to be able to deorbit it. And with fuel and oxidizer transferred, it's just a simple matter for Rodbart to go back out there and disconnect the pipe and put it back on the Curious. And he gets a last minute bit of inspiration to give this satellite a little bit of a push. You know, like, be gone, evil satellite that's up there cluttering our map view and making all our orbits look really, really ugly. We don't want to see you anymore. And once Robert is safely back aboard the Curious, it's time to deorbit this satellite. And so we get a nice sort of a, a passing glance at the Curious as we blow on by and bring our orbit down. And then it's time to start planning our course for our next satellite, Junk Site 8, Junk Sat 8 Redo. Now, this other satellite is in pretty much the same orbit as Junk Sat 8, except that it is ahead of us. And we all know what we got to do because this came up a number of episodes ago. Uh, to get to a position in our orbit that's ahead of us, we don't want to burn forward because burning forward will only raise your orbit um, and then cause you to go slower. What you need to do is speed yourself up and you speed yourself up by burning retrograde and lowering your orbit. But I got to be a little bit careful here because it's not like I got an infinite amount of retrograde burning that I can do. If I burn retrograde too much, I might end up bringing my periapsis down inside the atmosphere and then I got a whole different mess of problems. So the first thing I wanted to do was to set up a maneuver node so that I can just check to make sure that I can get my encounter without my periapsis uh, dipping into the atmosphere. And it turns out that I, I got plenty of room below me that doesn't turn out to be a problem. So then it's just a simple matter of turning the ship retrograde burning until I get my encounter as close as I can get it and then riding my orbit around uh, until I come up to my target after one complete uh, trip around the planet. And with Rod Bart's EVA desires satisfied this time it is Bill's turn once again so Bill very professionally connects the pipes we transfer over a little bit of fuel just like before, getting the tanks up to around 25%. And then Bill also uh, decides to give this thing a little bit of a push, though he has a little bit of trouble there with, uh, with that repair panel. It kind of kind of glitched a little bit, but off it goes. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like that shot. I like that shot of Bill there uh, with the satellite tumbling behind him. And of course we deorbit JunkSat 8 redo as well, and it's time to bring the boys on home. And so I set up my uh, my uh, maneuver to go back, and I I lucked out once again. I got another one of these ones where I could just hit the uh, one of the ascending or descending nodes right off the bat and uh, burn just a straight retrograde burn without having to make any normal adjustments. We get to the station we normally do, and then it's time to just bring these guys back on in for a well-deserved rest. Yeah, and you know, I kind of like the way I'm going to park it here on the side to give this station a little bit of asymmetry. I like a little bit of asymmetry. And I still got the one on the other side for parking an eventual space shuttle. Yeah, I do have a space shuttle in the building queue, but that's going to have to be for another episode. So we hope to see you then.